If Borderlands 4 fails, Borderlands dies. Okay, it's not exactly the case, but it's very close. Way too close. While Borderlands 2 and 3 will always have a consistent player base, the future of this franchise relies on Borderlands 4. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to make this clear before proceeding with the video, as some people out there for some reason defend Gearbox more than their own religious beliefs, or lack thereof, I am not going to pull any punches on a AAA game studio. They have the money, they have the time, but what they don't have is good management, which makes them think they don't have the money or the time. I don't like the fact that people think the only way to get their voice heard by a AAA game studio is to constructively criticize them in the most sugar-coated and softest way possible, but uh, I, don't, I don't really blame them. For most game devs, it must be difficult to be constantly fed hard truths from so many passionate fans of a game which they're mostly responsible for. Game devs need to open their eyes and understand that constructive criticism almost always comes from a place of love, but they always mistake it with destructive criticism which is just a fancy term for hating. Also, if it wasn't already clear, most of this video is me directly speaking to Gearbox, <laughs> which is the equivalent of speaking into a void due to my rather low subscriber count. So please subscribe, spread this video around, and give the video a like if you're feeling extra generous. But this video is also made for you to enjoy. I'd love to hear your thoughts and criticisms, whether it's about Borderlands or the video in general. Seriously though, I love reading your guys' comments, it's always genuinely interesting. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's finally break down why Borderlands 4 is the last straw for most Borderlands players. Cue the silly transition. Man, I haven't said that in a long time, have I? Damn! Lyle, Lyle, turn on the TV, they hit the Pentagon! Yeah, you know what they call Mulan in Mexico? What? They call her Molan. <laughs> That's good. Over the past year, Gearbox has been very consistently dropping fat piles of doo-doo feces. The last two DLCs for Borderlands 3, which I personally think isn't that bad, is widely hated amongst the fans. Wonderlands is a decent game with stunning visuals, but has one of the worst endgame loops in the history of video gaming. I would rather be put up against a coked up John Jones for 5 rounds with no breaks than be forced to play the Chaos Chambers for <laughs> anything more than an hour. No, it really is that bad. The new Tales from the Borderlands game has some of the worst and most insufferable dialogue I've ever had the displeasure of listening to. Imagine Marvel writing, but it somehow insults your intelligence even more. Kidding! <laughs> I'm not busy. Totally pranked you. <laughs> you just got octavio Interesting phrasing. Perhaps I'll adopt that. Uh, well, that's kind of my thing, but... Michael! Don't leave me here! <coughs> Michael! Michael! If you want to know more about how insanely bad this new Tales game is, feel free to watch this Eruption Fang video. It is one of my favorite videos on his channel. Not only is it informative, but really hilarious, so go check that out if you'd like. Now how could I possibly forget to bring up the really random and pointless DLC they added to Borderlands 2, which broke the endgame even more than it already was? Why would you add level caps to a game you haven't touched in like 5 years? Just what was the thought process? A close friend of mine loves Borderlands 2 passionately, and has been playing the endgame for a while before this DLC even existed. So I decided to call him up and quickly ask him his thoughts on it. So, uh, enjoy the clip. I mean, yeah, it's one last DLC added to the game for a shitty Borderlands advertisement. It ruined uh, the endgame with uh, dog shit, modifications and scalings. All, end all the endgame bosses are ruined. So it uh, makes the game at least have 100 minus less hours of gameplay. It's shit. And it's terrible. Now I could go on for hours on Gearbox's bad decisions and controversies, which doesn't exactly have people thinking about Borderlands 4 right now, but rather thinking about what Gearbox's next biggest blunder is going to be. With that being said, let's delve into the core of this video, which is what I think should be next for Borderlands 4. So what better way to start than talking about the, the technical schmecknickle stuff? Man, I really didn't know what to title this section. Whatever, let's let's just get it out of the way. What? <laughs> what is that? My friends, uh, the other day, were talking about separating the art from the artist, and I blurted out Mein Kampf. <laughs> now, what I'm about to say might be a bit controversial, and I can completely understand why some of you might disagree with this, but Gearbox, if you really want to make Borderlands 4 the best possible version of itself, 
then don't release it on last gen consoles. Borderlands 3 on the PS4 was already nightmarish enough. I think it's time to just pull the plug when it comes to adding new Borderlands games onto old gen consoles. Also, quick side note, quite recently Borderlands 3 has made its way onto the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> And it genuinely looks almost as bad as Mortal Kombat 1 does on the Switch. It's... it's a sight to behold. The only exceptions I can see for last gen ports is if they plan on remastering Borderlands 2 or any older title, which I don't see why those consoles can't have that too. Now why am I saying this? What benefit does Borderlands 4 have for not being on old gen consoles? Well, for starters, they can actually add pearls without worrying about the consoles spontaneously combusting. For some of you that don't know, the primary reason as to why Borderlands 3 doesn't have any rarity beyond Legendary is that old gen consoles genuinely could not handle any more rarities. The fact that simply a new set of guns with a different colored beam of light is a risk to the game's functionality in older gen consoles is just one of the many signs that those consoles just can't handle new quality games anymore. It's time to stop being held back and just let go. Speaking of games barely functioning, Gearbox, please take your time with Borderlands 4. There is absolutely zero rush or high demand for this game right now. You took your time with Borderlands 3, but you sure didn't take your time with Wonderlands. That game came out with snipers, shotguns, and rocket launchers all being severely underpowered. Well, yeah, I, on release, I think there was a ton of problems. It was a pistol SMG meta through and through. They made a patch. It was still pistol SMG meta. We cannot have a Wonderland situation again. Please make sure that Borderlands 4 comes out with as little bugs as possible and make sure the game is decently optimized for all platforms. We're not asking for much here, just the bare minimum for a triple A game release. Also one last note for this section, but Gearbox, please optimize your menus before launch. Borderlands 3's menus were super laggy at launch and even today can get laggy at times. Also visually it looks really cluttered. Speaking of menus, there is a certain multiplayer mechanic which I will never understand why they keep bringing back. It's not a quirky feature, but it's just really annoying. What I'm talking about is not being able to fast travel while your friends have their menus open. If you've played any Borderlands game with your friends, even the pre-sequel, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. I personally can't recall any franchise besides Borderlands that does this. It's just so stupid and halts the momentum for literally no reason. Granted, this does make for a lot of funny moments where friends are flaming each other for still having their menus open while they want to progress through the story, but it's not funny for the right reason. Talking way too Boo much. Boograce, why did you open your inventory, Boograce? I'll open your f***ing skull and drink it, Gerald. One last thing I want to bring up before we move on is how Gearbox still hasn't figured out how to keep players in the same party after they save quit. How is this an issue in every single Borderlands game? Borderlands is constantly advertised as a great game to play with friends, and yet you make it so annoying to do so. As far as I'm concerned, this issue wasn't even resolved in Wonderlands, a game that came out only like a year and a half ago. Despite that, Gearbox are really good at implementing quality of life changes throughout each game, with every mainline game only getting better and better. This is even showcased a bit in Wonderlands of all games. Wonderlands made something like the anointment system a lot less tedious. The anointment price increases the more you use it, rather than in Borderlands 3 where it's at a set price of 250 iridium, which is ridiculously high in that game but we'll talk about anointments more later on. Now let's move on to probably the lengthiest section of this video, the gameplay. Cue the mini transition. Yes! He jumped more than down there. Oh, no! <laughs> no way, no way. Borderlands is a franchise that just loves to experiment when it comes to gameplay and I absolutely love that. There has never been a Borderlands game that has come out and hasn't surprised people with its new and fresh additions. For better or for worse. Most experiments with Borderlands tend to end up pretty successful, 
there are only a few experiments with the franchise which fans don't look back on very fondly. Mad Moxie's Underdome Riot, the Holodome Onslaught, Arms Race, and the Chaos Chambers. Notice how all of these are basically synonymous with prison. Borderlands isn't really new to the concept of missions where they lock you in an area for a while and you fight to the end, but these ones in particular are infamous for really sucking at it. Basically what I'm trying to say is besides these specific cases, Borderlands almost always nails their new ideas. Borderlands 4's gameplay is something I'm really worried for, as Borderlands 3's gameplay is so solid that I don't know how they can top it without messing something up really badly. Wonderlands is a great example of this, since it's a game that uses Borderlands 3's engine, and despite how beautiful it is and how interesting the new class system is, one department they surprisingly completely butchered are the numbers, which killed the game for a lot of people. Borderlands 3 wasn't the greatest with numbers either, but with plenty of feedback and experience, Gearbox got really good at improving and fixing the game, whether it was weapon changes, exploits, or game-breaking bugs. For example, at the beginning of Borderlands 3's cycle, they made some really horrible nerfs, which still affect guns to this day, like removing the fourth pellet from the crossroads. Myself, alongside most of the community, will never forgive Gearbox for that insanely dumb decision. <laughs> I love how people still bring it up to this day despite this nerf happening over three years ago. But later on you have some incredible buffs which make guns not only viable, but extremely fun. Like the buff they gave the Hellwalker, which people absolutely went crazy for. Sometime in late 2020, they buffed the Hellwalker's damage by 315%, which made it one of the greatest weapons in the game. Now there are definitely some crazy, stupidly overpowered DLC weapons, which we'll get into later, do not worry, which are better than the Hellwalker, but a lot of people still choose to have that weapon on their build due to how purely fun it is. As important as numbers are to discuss when it comes to Borderlands, it can get pretty boring to talk about, so let's talk about something more interesting. Gameplay mechanics. As great as Borderlands 3's gameplay is, there are definitely some mechanics that can absolutely be changed or expanded upon, like sliding, slamming, and meleeing. Sliding is pretty cool, and it's definitely something I'm thankful for since it adds more fluidity to the gameplay, but if you're not using a snowdrift, <laughs> sliding can kind of feel like you're dragging your ass through sandpaper. There are some artifact prefixes like Static Charge, Radio Dead, Rocket Boots, and Splatter Gun, which try to add cool effects and damage to your slide, but ultimately end up extremely underwhelming. Splatter Gun in particular is so incredibly boring and pathetic, plus 50% shotgun damage while sliding. <laughs> really? How often are you sliding right into enemies' faces and shooting your gun at the same time? Conceptually, it's cool, but not in a game where enemies in the max difficulty might as well give you a seizure warning with how aggressive they are. Slamming on the other hand was especially underutilized in Borderlands 3, which is kind of sad when you compare it to butt slamming in the pre-sequel, which was honestly super fun, creative, and pretty satisfying. Granted, I didn't really touch the pre-sequel's endgame, but from what I heard, I don't even think that's really a thing, so we'll try to exclude numbers and viability for a bit. In Borderlands 3, the only thing I found memorable with slamming is that there's this Guardian rank skill which lets you slam after your regular jump, instead of at a certain height. This ability is so ridiculous and actually surprisingly useful when it comes to survivability. Instead of meleeing an enemy to stun them, slamming has a small AoE that can just stun a small group of enemies, which is kind of neat. Slamming also works with Groundbreaker, and Groundbreaker is just such a fun Guardian rank skill in general. You don't need a crazy build to mess around with how broken and fun this can be. I'll probably play a clip right now showcasing what you can do with this goofy skill. Slamming is kind of like sliding in the sense that I'm thankful for it and it adds more to the gameplay, but it's definitely underwhelming at times. But by far the most interesting thing that can be done with slamming is that there is somehow slam builds that exist and are actually really strong, which is just as ridiculous as it sounds, and really goes to show how stupid this game can be with the right interactions. <laughs> I 
So shout out every Borderlands 3 build maker for consistently making the wackiest builds and game viable. I'm going to play a small clip from this video made by B Flattened where he showcases his Moe's slam build. <laughs> there are no words I can provide to prepare you for the sheer insanity you're about to witness. So uh, just just take a look. It's insane. Here you go. If you think that amount of screen shake is crazy, I implore you to watch a Garwood Maliwan takedown speedrun and try not to collapse and froth at the mouth. <laughs> Why did I write that joke? <laughs> anyway, let's move on from slamming and talk about meleeing. Borderlands 3 was kinda disappointing when it came to pure melee builds. Now for the record, there is a massive difference between melee interactions and just purely meleeing an enemy, which is what I'm talking about. So no stingers, face punchers, fish slaps, white elephants, just none of that stuff. I'm talking about walking up to an enemy or boss and just smacking him in the mouth. That's what I mean by a pure melee build. There are a ton of missed opportunities when it comes to this, like a popular example is how there isn't a single skill on Zane that does something with this really cool looking melee weapon. Why? Every character has a cool melee weapon and animation. Zane has his halo looking weapon, Flak has his giant tooth looking thing, Moe's has a cool knife animation, and what does Amara have? A palm strike. <laughs> Can you guess which character got all the melee skills? What I find really interesting about Borderlands 3 is how there actually was a real plan for melee weapons in the game. I believe the first sign was in the Bounty of Blood DLC, where you were supposed to get Rose's katana after defeating her, and it was going to be a usable melee weapon, and not just some gimmick. Not entirely sure why they didn't include this in the game, but my guess is that they imagined it'd be weird to have only one melee weapon, and they'd much rather have it be its own weapon type with variants and manufacturers. And that is exactly what they did in Wonderland. And honestly, it was really well done, aside from some issues which made it a bit frustrating to use. Melee weapons are a request fans have had for years for the Borderlands franchise. Borderlands already has incredible gun combat. What says it can't do the same with melee weapons? Wonderlands made melee weapons a secondary thing and not something they really expected people to make many builds revolving around. But people still found ways to make it work, and for the most part, it was super fun. The only issues with melee weapons is how the game itself just did not favor melee combat. Most enemies had an attack exclusively made to punish the player if they got too close. Every single boss in Wonderlands genuinely had attacks or mechanics specifically designed to prevent any melee engagement. It was pretty ridiculous, almost like the game was designed without melee weapons in mind. With that being said, melee weapons were not all bad. They were balanced really well, they were incredibly fun to mob with, and honestly, they just looked really sick. I mean, just take a second to admire how beautiful and creative these designs are. I hope Borderlands 4 expands on these three aspects of gameplay, I really hope they figure out a way to fit melee weapons into the game, because it really would be a shame if they didn't take anything from Wonderlands. It's not like melee weapons couldn't work in the Borderlands universe, a lot of enemies and characters use melee weapons regularly, and it doesn't look out of place at all. There are a surprising amount of characters that primarily use melee weapons, I'll name ones I can remember from Borderlands 3. I'm very sure there are a lot more, so feel free to tell me the ones I missed in the comments. So we got Zero, Shiv, Katagawa Jr., Grave Ward, Agonizer 9000, Troy Calypso, Empowered Gron, This Moron, Rose, Psycho Reaver. Honestly, most enemies wield melee weapons pretty regularly. I mean, one of the most iconic weapons in Borderlands history is the Buzzaxe, and for good reason. That thing's pretty badass. Troy Calypso is strangely my favorite example of this because his sword looks so damn cool and I am so mad that nothing cool was done with it. If melee weapons make it to Borderlands 4, Gearbox, please make this weapon usable. I don't care if Troy Calypso comes back from the dead like dry bones. 
<laughs> I just want to use this sword so bad, man. Now, something I'm really, really concerned for in Borderlands 4, more than anything, is how they deal with anointments. Because in my opinion, anointments might be one of the worst additions to Borderlands gameplay ever. We do not want to see anointments come back. I'm pretty sure in Borderlands 3, finding the specific gun you want with the right element and then the right anointment, like what you're looking for is literally more rare than a 94 sham. And even though they added the anointment re-roller machines, they were still insanely annoying to use to find the right anointment because there are simply so many of them. For those that don't know, anointments or enchantments, which is how Wonderlands refers to them, is basically a silly bit of text you can get under most of your gear or weapons which modifies certain characters action skills, augments, or gives you general bonuses under random conditions. You only really start getting anointments at the end game. You can get them during the story from Crazy Earl, but it's just not worth the iridium. You're better off saving it for later. Now, in theory, anointments should not be such a devastating gameplay feature. It's just a silly little damage bonus with conditions. Shouldn't be a problem if it's just a bonus, right? <laughs> wrong. Incredibly wrong. In Borderlands 2, the pre-sequel, and even Borderlands 1, whenever you farm for a weapon, you farm for a weapon with the best parts. You'd farm for the perfect version of a weapon that you could possibly get, sometimes depending on your build. So when you're farming for a weapon, whenever it drops, you'll typically analyze the actual weapon to see if it has the parts you're looking for. Which is honestly super cool and made people look incredibly smart. I remember watching Jolt's Dude or Killer6 as a kid and I'd always be mind blown at how they were able to tell how good or bad a weapon was by just looking at it. On the other hand, in Borderlands 3 and Wonderlands, for most weapons and gear that you farm for, the first thing you're gonna look at when you see a weapon isn't even the weapon. You'll walk over to it and see if the stupid underlying text is the one that fits with your build. I want you to think about this for a second. In Borderlands 2, you analyze a piece of gear to see if it has the correct parts. In Borderlands 3, you look for the correct sentence under a weapon. Is that not so incredibly lame? Borderlands 3 really had no loot chase, so loot chase was anointments on the legendaries that were already dropping like candy in the first place. So what did you really get excited for other than right parts on the legendary? You didn't get starstruck when a legendary dropped, you got starstruck when it had the fire elements and it had the right anointment and you didn't have to re-roll it at the Crazy Earl's re-roll. Now I know some of you nerds out there are going to point out that not all gear works like that. Things like the front loader, the boom sickle, the chaosin, the head explosion, the revolter, the clairvoyance, yada yada, all have parts that drastically affect their functionality. That's all well and true, but if you didn't have the correct anointments, they'd be damn near useless. But this problem would eventually become a lot less egregious when Borderlands 3 finally added in a rerolling system. One month before the final DLC released, but. <laughs> Better late than never, I, I guess. Man, can you guys even comprehend the fact that Borderlands 3 for like a good two years just didn't have an anointment rerolling system? <laughs> Dude, imagine farming for a boomsicle with the anointment that you wanted back in the day, man. That's <laughs> that's gotta be a torture method in some like up third world country, man. That's. <laughs> To everyone's surprise, when Wonderlands came out, it actually had a rerolling system, which was far superior to Borderlands 3, but didn't come without its issues. In Wonderlands, your first reroll would be really cheap, but the price would double every reroll until it would stop increasing at 4,000, which for that game is pretty fair. You can get a nice amount of rerolls before it hits this price. The only problem with this system is that Gearbox just got so lazy and didn't feel like balancing how many moon orbs they'd give you, so they just capped the amount you could have at 16,000, so you'd have to play again once you run out of your pitiful amount of moon orbs. It's things like this which is why I don't like Wonderlands. For a game so beautiful and expressive, the endgame just really hates it when you start having fun, 
Wonderland's endgame is just so anti-fun, it's crazy. There's a reason I'll never stop comparing the Chaos Chambers to a prison or an asylum. Borderlands 4 needs to either just get rid of this whole anointment slash enchantment system, which I'm personally in favor of, or come up with something completely new, or just make anointments not nearly as important. Killer6 made a pretty solid short video recently where he talks about how Borderlands 4 could approach anointments, and he opts for anointments to be weapon trinkets that give small bonuses, which I think is such a simple and creative solution to this massive issue. I'll link the video in the description, it's pretty short and he goes into more detail on how it would work, so check it out if you're interested. Now ladies and gentlemen, some of you are probably wondering why I'm almost exclusively talking about the endgame. Well that's because when it comes to Borderlands games, the endgame is one of the most important parts of those games. For example, Wonderlands has a really fun story and has some of my favorite base game side quests of the whole franchise, while Borderlands 3 has a lot of boring base game side quests and one of the worst stories of the whole franchise only being second to New Tales in the Borderlands which is a whole different beast of bad writing. Despite Wonderlands having a much better story and side quests, the lack of endgame and horrible endgame balancing ends up in Wonderlands Steam charts looking like this, Borderlands 2 over doubling its average players, not to mention Borderlands 3 having over triple Wonderlands average players. Wonderlands went on Steam only 90 days after launch, while Borderlands 3 went on Steam 182 days after launch. Some of you dingleberries out there might bring up the fact that Wonderlands is a spin-off and that because of this I shouldn't compare these two games. Well my rebuttal is, I don't care. <laughs> if I'm being charged $60 for Wonderlands, it better be on the same level as Borderlands 3, if not higher. Borderlands 3's endgame is amazing and yet so simple. What makes it so great is that due to its simplicity and quality, the replayability is very high. Maliwan Takedown is arguably the best piece of Borderlands Endgame content ever, and it only came out two months into release, and people have been begging Gearbox for Endgame content similar to this ever since. The Guardian Takedown is another raid, and it came out like a year later. It isn't nearly as good, but the idea was there, and the visuals and boss fights were just as good, if not better. As good as the raids are, there's still plenty of endgame content to sort through. The Halloween event, Revenge of the Cartels, the Trials, the Circles of Slaughter. You also have True Vault Hunter mode, which is a new game plus, that doesn't really change anything but allows you to replay the game with all your levels and gear. If you really wanted to, you could replay the game at max level on the highest difficulty with a perfect build. Honestly, this would be far more amusing if the story just wasn't so terrible. Endgame content is what keeps Borderlands games alive. Borderlands 4 just needs to take what Borderlands 3 has done and execute it better, balance it better, and focus on making it as fun as possible. Borderlands 3, despite its terrible story, brought so much to this beloved franchise and people have sadly taken it all for granted due to Gearbox's constant mistakes and terrible decision making. Borderlands 3 brought us an insane level of customization, both gameplay and cosmetic. Each character got three action skills, one for each skill tree, and then a fourth one with the designer's cut. We got action skill augments, which characters all deal with in different and interesting ways, leading to lots of build variety and gameplay styles. Simply just the way the game feels is so satisfying. The crisp sound effects, the impact your attacks have, like when you melee an enemy, slam on an enemy, slide into an enemy, go all out on a boss and watch its health disappear faster than cotton candy dipped in water. <laughs> it's all just so damn good. But ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately not everyone is going to care enough to get to the end game or even play enough of the game to get a taste of how good it really is. And it's all because Gearbox fumbled one thing so incredibly hard. And that thing is the story. Throughout this video you've been hearing me simply reference it as bad, so I figure it's time we take a second and acknowledge why that is. Cue the mini transition. I've seen it in regularity, get in here! <laughs> 
Hold on a second, there is one thing I somehow completely forgot to talk about regarding Borderlands 3's endgame, because even though in its final state it's decently balanced and really fun, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. There was a certain 6 month period which made the endgame not fun for a lot of people including myself, and was genuinely one of the first times I took an extended break from the game because I was pretty furious. The words Mayhem 2.0 will immediately trigger flashbacks for anyone who played the game from this being released until Mayhem 11 came along and saved us all from going insane. Borderlands 3 launched with only 3 Mayhem levels. Those were a bit rough, but a lot of things got balanced and fixed as Mayhem 4 and Maliwan Takedown came out, and this for a lot of people was the absolute peak of this game's endgame balancing. Despite how solid the game was at this point, there were still quite a few bugs, exploits, and overall issues with Mayhem, but they weren't that big of a deal since the game at this point was really fun. Which is all you need a game to be. You know, fun. Mayhem 2.0 launched, and we got six more Mayhem levels. For no damn reason alongside these Mayhem modifiers, which you are not allowed to turn off. The way these modifiers worked is that there could only be up to four of them active all at once, ranging from easy, medium, hard, or very hard, although this pattern would vary depending on what Mayhem level you were playing on. Gearbox, for some reason while making this update, had a firm belief that difficulty just meant how annoying a game was, which could not be further from the truth. Borderlands 3's endgame went from being simply badass to one big fat Looney Tunes segment that just would not end. Mayhem 2.0 wanted to punish you for literally just playing the game, and it was so annoying. If you merely shot an enemy, Here's the modifiers that could punish you for that. If you killed an enemy, here's the disgusting amount of modifiers that could punish you for that. If you approached an enemy, you could also be punished for that. If you were standing still in combat, God forbid you need a second to aim, reload, or take cover, you could be punished for that. Obviously, not all of these were active at once, but if you take a second to just read some of these modifiers, they don't make the game funner or add any improvements or interesting mechanics. It just made the game less fun. The easy modifiers were the only cool and interesting modifiers as they actually modify the game. The definition to modify is to make partial or minor changes to something typically as to improve it or to make it less extreme. These modifiers worsened the game and made it far more extreme. Gearbox eventually realized how insufferable Mayhem modifiers were, but instead of making another rework, they gave us Mayhem 11. And you know what? I am fine with that. I'll take Mayhem 11 any day of the week instead of playing this absolute disaster of an endgame system. For those of you that don't know, Mayhem 11 is the same difficulty as Mayhem 10, except there's no Mayhem modifiers, which is why the gameplay on screen is actually watchable and was really fun to record. Whenever I refer to Borderlands 3's endgame and how much I enjoy it, I'm mostly referring to Mayhem 11, which is genuinely really fun, balanced, and whenever it's challenging, for the most part, it's pretty fair. Anyway, enough about Mayhem, and let's actually move on to the next section, which is mostly about Borderlands 3's story. So now, cue that mini transition. There's over seven realms. What? There's <laughs> what? I'm not, I'm not picking this up and making you come. That it, pause. <laughs> uh, um. For this section, I'm not going to retell every Borderlands story to tell you why Borderlands 3's story is bad, but I highly recommend you either play the games or watch some video on YouTube. If you plan on doing the latter, then check out this incredible video by Cartoon She. 
it is genuinely one of my favorite videos on the platform. Don't let the length scare you, I promise, it's worth the watch. I am very concerned for what direction Borderlands 4's story is going to take, because despite Borderlands 3's blunder, there are still so many ways to build off of it and make for a great next step for the franchise. Borderlands 3 ended off with Lilith literally stealing the moon. <laughs> I am not making this up. This is not a Despicable Me reference. This is canon. And honestly, kind of a cool idea. Granted, the last cutscene where they show this is so hilariously bad, and it doesn't help that for the credits they played... <laughs> <laughs> Alicia Keys' Girl on Fire, which I'm sure most of you know that song. Honestly, one of the most embarrassing f***ing things I've ever seen. Just to cuts to the f***ing credits, and it's that. Truth Can you imagine being the person who decided to put that song in the credits? Man, I really wish I recorded my friend Ali's reaction to this for the first time. <laughs> it was... It was absolute comedy gold, we, we couldn't stop laughing. I did talk to him about the ending later on, and he did have a really good suggestion for where the story could go next. We should go and find Lilith, so we'd be prepared for a war. Now the most infamous mention of a war, as most of you probably know, is the Watcher at the end of the pre-sequel, when she saves Athena from a firing squad and warns us that War is coming. And you will need all the vault hunters you can get. People wanted Borderlands 3 to be the war that the Watcher was talking about. But sadly, it was just a stupid conflict that didn't give off any sense of urgency. I understand that making an entire war and bringing back tons of vault hunters for one story is pretty difficult, but I think it's still very possible. There are tons of videos on YouTube, discussions on Reddit, where people talk about where they want the franchise to head in next, so if this idea is too grand and difficult to execute, it's definitely not the only one out there. Anyway, let's actually talk about Borderlands 3's story. Borderlands 3's story is an absolute disaster of bad writing, insufferable dialogue, slow pacing. Damn, we really just played through all of Eden 6 and it was not that great. Yeah. Cool weapons, though. True. And worst of all, cringe. It's her choice to go down, Lilith. Shut up. Oh, I hate this voice line so much. <laughs> There's a healthy mix of new and old characters, but none of the new characters really stand out, except maybe Balex. I really like Balex. He's got a lot of funny lines, and most of you already know. He's voiced by Ice-T, and he's a surprisingly great voice actor. There's also Ava. <laughs> Man, I could make a whole video on how terrible she is, but basically, imagine if Tiny Tina was stripped of all her redeeming qualities, and all she did was complain and yap, yap, yap. I want to be a Vault Hunter too, Lilith. <laughs> You're supposed to run towards the fire. Shut up, dude. <laughs> the worst part is that the game really wants you to feel bad for Ava. For example, after the laughable cutscene of Maya's unfortunate demise, where she completely turns to dust, except her book for some reason. Also, this cutscene brings up another massive issue with Borderlands 3's story. You, as the Vault Hunter doing 90% of the work, are never in the cutscenes and are rarely even referenced in them. I would have liked if Gearbox just showed us why we couldn't do anything against the Calypsos, instead of Lilith going, Hey, killer. It's not your fault Maya's dead. I don't blame you for sitting at a corner while watching, I don't know, top 10 hottest Sonic characters. There you have it, folks. Those were the hottest female chicks in the Sonic universe. Probably the worst example of the Vault Hunters being left out of cutscenes is at the end of the game, but we'll get to that in a bit. But after all this hippity hoopla, we return to Sanctuary to talk to Lilith. My favorite activity in this game, which... I assure you, doesn't get repetitive. After we talk to Lilith, we witness some of the most insufferable dialogue ever. We get the whole shebang. We get Tannis being unfunny at probably the most inappropriate time possible. I knew Maya when she was alive. I preferred her that way. That didn't come out right. But she's gone, and that's how it is. We get Ava yelling at Lilith and blaming her for Maya's passing? Despite Ava being half the reason she's dead? Maya's dead, 
Because you wanted to open the vaults. We should be hunting down the Calypsos and making them pay for what they did. It's not that easy. And the worst part is that Lilith takes it as if Ava's in the right somehow? Maya always told me a vault hunter runs toward the fire. All her stories were about you. You saved Pandora. You killed Handsome Jack. You're supposed to be the Firehawk. I, I don't know what I am. Figure it out, Lilith, before you get someone else killed. Ava showed up to the vault while she wasn't supposed to, yelled at the Calypsos while Maya didn't even want to engage, literally saying, We're leaving. Now. Unfortunately, Borderlands 3 has a <laughs> very well-written story, so it couldn't just stop there. Maya sacrifices herself to save a character who has done nothing but make my ears bleed and will only continue to do so. Awesome. It's just an all-around disaster. And the worst part is when all is said and done, the game wants us to console Ava on Maya's passing. Give me one reason why I should care about Ava. Why should I take the time out of my playthrough to walk into her room and make her feel any better? To the kid? Why do I want to talk to the kid? I don't know this character enough to give a singular care. All she has done is yell at everyone, even the Calypsos. I'm gonna be a sire, and then I'm gonna mop the floor with assholes like you. You're gonna... <laughs> is that how you think this works? And then cry when her actions have consequences. There is one saving grace to all this though. There's an animatic of Maya's funeral, and it is amazing. The writers went crazy cooking this one up. Lilith even shuts down Tannis immediately for her inappropriate timing and reminds her of their current situation. So he can leech sirens besides his own sister? Fascinating. I wonder if that interferes with Maya's intent to- Not now, Patricia. This is the Lilith I want, a leader, not a figurehead. She feels like a real character. Even in the beginning of this cutscene, it shows that the Vault Hunters were supposed to be more involved as Lilith confronts you first. Vault Hunter, you're back. Why didn't you report on the Echo Net? This single cutscene would have done so much good for this dumpster fire of a story. I don't even know where to start. First of all, the cutscene actually pays respects to Maya via a proper funeral showing all the characters mourn over her passing. Even Krieg was briefly shown hiding in the background. Ava also finally gets some character development. This cutscene shows that she's more than just an angsty teen. She feels remorseful and responsible for something she realistically couldn't do that much about. When Lilith's having her talk with Ava, she even brings up how she went through a really similar situation with Roland's death. I made my share of screw-ups. Running toward the fire all the time gets you burned. But you never got anyone killed. I did. Someone I cared about. Oh. Hey guys, Editor Bugrais here. I just wanted to interrupt the flow of the video for a few seconds just to glaze this cutscene a little bit more because I feel like even though I talked about it quite a bit in the video, I didn't do it enough justice. I just wanted to say that the voice actors here absolutely crush it. Lilith and Ava's voice actors deliver their lines with so much raw emotion and passion, it is amazing. You don't really get to hear much of this in the game because due to how awful the writing is, the voice actors don't get many chances to shine. Ava's yelling being so annoying isn't completely the voice actor's fault, it's just that they wrote her character to be that insufferable and bratty and left out so many meaningful moments that would have made the players care for this character and forgive them for making our ears bleed. The writing in this cutscene is so good too, man. Lines like, running towards the fire gets you burned, actually gives meaning to that stupid line of, Vault Hunters run towards the fire, which is repeated in the game with no purpose other than it's supposed to be a badass saying or something. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. I'll leave you guys with the last few seconds of this cutscene, then the video will continue like nothing ever happened.
Enjoy. I want to make what Maya saw in me real. I want to learn and fight and be a vault hunter. I want to join the Crimson Raiders. Then welcome to the family. I'll link the six minute animatic in the description. It's so good, even if you aren't super educated on the Borderlands franchise, this will bring a tear to your eye. This cutscene would have been the perfect send off to Maya. I really would have loved to see this fully animated. I don't know what Gearbox's situation with their writing staff is, because the writing is insanely inconsistent. The first four DLCs have incredible writing. The Creek DLC in particular almost made me cry the first time I saw the amazing final cutscene. How does something so beautiful stem from a game which has villains unironically taunting you by calling you a turd farmer? Hey turd farmers, check this out! What happened? I really want to know. Borderlands 3's story feels so rushed. It doesn't feel like something that was crafted with any love or care. It feels like a really bad fanfiction or something. I guess the fanfiction theory might be a decent explanation as to why so many characters care about Ava when there's no reason to. <laughs> Maybe Ava's just some sicko self-insert or something. <laughs> I don't know, man. This brings us to the last cutscene, and this one is just as bad, if not worse. After the Vault Hunters slay Tyreen relatively quickly, Seriously though, she is a really easy fight. I think I genuinely struggled more fighting Troy. I honestly think Troy's fight is just much cooler in general. I mean, just look at the map side to side. Anyway, Lilith then comes in limping and holding onto her stomach for some reason, when all that happened in the last cutscene was Tyreen held her up like a doll for two seconds and then dropped her. But whatever. I guess maybe off camera some bandit came in and gave her a three piece like Jorge Masvidal. That's my only guess. She gets her powers back by touching Tyreen's rotting corpse, and then we get a cool shot of the Firehawk. Wahoo! Yippee! She's back! Girl boss or something. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I give up. <laughs> Tannis then says that the Vault on Elpis is still opening, which means Pandora's doomed. Ava then asks, how do we stop it? And Tannis replies with, Very simple. We can't. Not unless you know a way to remove the moon from the sky. You like... <laughs> you like foreshadowing? After Tannis says this, Lilith decides to take this literally and decides that her next move is to somehow remove the moon but not before saying this to Ava. Sanctuary is yours, Ava. Be ready. I don't think I have to explain why handing the responsibility of a massive spaceship inhabiting the lives of hundreds to someone who hasn't even hit puberty yet is an awful idea. There are three completely capable adults <laughs> and one robot right behind her who are far more deserving and capable of running Sanctuary. Tannis could run it for all I care, but you give it to Ava? Hello? I really wish the stupidity stopped right here, but no, there's even more to this cutscene. Once Lilith goes all hero mode and starts charging towards Elpis, we get a shot of everyone's reaction to what's going on. We get a shot of Tina, Brick, and Mordecai, Vaughn, and then some folks on Sanctuary. These three reactions all make sense because Elpis is visible to them. Unfortunately, common sense is a conspiracy theory to the writers of Borderlands 3's base game story. So after this, we get reactions from people on Promethea, Eden 6, and Necro to fail. How? Literally, how? This is the equivalent of looking at Earth's moon from Uranus or something. You just can't. <laughs> it's impossible. I mean, you'd also probably be dead, but you, you get my point. After everyone uses their superhuman eyesight to watch Lilith disappear with Elpis in the blink of an eye, Ava unfortunately speaks up, saying that Lilith isn't gone. She's lighting the way. 
which only makes me question how a dumb teenager is able to make more astute observations than arguably the smartest character in the franchise? Sure, I guess. Anyway, the screen cuts to black, credits roll, Alicia Keys' Girl on Fire plays, and we all laugh because it's all just so stupid. I genuinely think ChatGPT could have written a better story than this. It probably would have written a boring one, but at least it would attempt to respect the audience intelligence. It is so easy for Borderlands 4 to top the disaster that is Borderlands 3's story, so I don't have many expectations. Gearbox, if you want to win the fans over again, then make Borderlands 4's story about the war the Watcher warned us about. Please put as much effort into crafting the story as you did the gameplay. The gameplay is so meticulously crafted while the story is such an afterthought, despite Gearbox advertising Borderlands 3 as a much more story-focused game with more cutscenes and lore, etc, etc. So there you have it. If you thought this section was longer than it should have been, I hope you know I shortened it as much as I possibly could have. Anyway, I'll quickly talk about the DLCs and we'll conclude the video. So, uh, cue that Silly transition. <laughs> For some reason, my aim is really like wide. Ex you know oh, oh, bro, stop, stop, stop. So, uh, my, for some reason, my aim, my game just broke. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in your game broke because you lost to me. That's crazy. It's, it's so insane to me. That's so, oh, that's so, that's so crazy. <laughs> Borderlands has such a great track record when it comes to DLCs. The pre-sequel, for example, is a game which fans don't look back on so fondly, yet has one of the greatest DLCs the franchise has ever seen, that completely saved the game from being nothing but a distant memory. Even Borderlands 1, a pretty outdated game, has a DLC which greatly elevated it. The Secret Armory of General Knox is a fan-favorite DLC and even introduced a fan-favorite weapon rarity, Pearlescence. <gasps> no way! Are you serious? I've been wanting you. I, I called it too. I'm like, dude, I want a Bessie. I want a Bessie. There it is. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Borderlands 2 is no stranger to great DLCs either and probably has the most honest and consistent quality DLCs. Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep was a fan favorite Borderlands 2 DLC and was so loved that it spawned an entire spin off game being Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. Tiny Tina's DLC was far from the only good DLC. You had Mr. Torg's Campaign of Carnage, Captain Scarlet and her Pirate's Booty, and then you had the Psycho and Mechromancer pack, which added two whole new playable Vault Hunters. To the game. Borderlands 3, on the other hand, took a very different approach to new Vault Hunters, so for the fifth DLC, aka the Designer's Cut, instead of adding a new playable Vault Hunter, they added a fourth skill tree to every character. I think the fourth skill trees are cool, but I'm not sure if it's fair to lock something like that behind a paywall. I feel like a new playable character is a much more understandable and fair DLC, but we'll get into that later. Borderlands 2 also had these mini DLCs called Headhunter Packs, which are very fairly priced at $3 a pop. You get a fun single main quest to embark on and some side quests. People really liked Headhunters because they were honest packages of content. It wasn't advertised as anything more than it was. It was just go on this fun little journey, kill this boss, and get some loot. Wonderland's DLCs did a similar thing to Headhunters but with much less content, priced at $10 a pop, which is over triple the price of a headhunter, and was just such an absolute joke that articles started coming out about how lackluster these DLCs are. Gearbox had this pathetic attempt at trying to justify explaining that these aren't DLCs, but PLCs, aka post-launch content. Well, yeah, of course it's post-launch content, you dip. That's what DLCs are. Erm, um, actually, they're PLCs. <laughs> I should give you a wedgie for saying something so stupid. <laughs> that sounds so mean. <laughs>
One of my favorite displays of how much of a joke these DLCs are is when the first one came out and Jolt's Dude speed ran it in under 8 minutes. This is one of my favorite Jolt's Dude videos because there's this part that I'll never forget and it's just so funny. So part of the mission literally has you just waiting around for 3 whole minutes for a door to open. <laughs> so Jolt decides to take this time to mess around in Microsoft Paint. And then we're gonna sit here for three minutes doing nothing, yeah. Um, you could mob if you want to, but again, it doesn't even do anything. So I would say in the meantime, how about we do some some paint? Yeah, let's uh, maybe paint what we're gonna do to the boss while waiting. So let's do, I don't know, let's draw a shark. I'll link the video in the description. It's only eight minutes, so if you wanna check it out, feel free to do so. Anyway, let's talk about Borderlands 3's DLC. Borderlands 3 had two season pass. The first one contained four story DLC, and the second contained two DLC, but only one had some sort of a story. The first season pass was really good. It followed a pretty simple but very effective formula. Solid story, fun side quests, absolutely stunning maps, I mean half of these look like paintings come to life, new enemy types, cool bosses, and the most important one of all, some incredibly fun weapons and gear. Sadly, it isn't all sunshine and rainbows as the first season pass does have its fair share of issues. For starters, these DLC are really hard to compare to one another because they all have very different strengths and weaknesses. The story's quality and length all drastically differ. Like the first DLC, Moxie's Heist of the Handsome Jackpot, has one of the most boring and forgettable villains of all time. Now compare this with the third DLC, Bounty of Blood, which has one of the most badass villains in the franchise. And yes, this is the same villain I brought up earlier who was originally going to drop a usable melee weapon. So there's just one of the many reasons Rose is pretty damn cool. The fourth DLC, Psycho Krieg and the Fantastic Fuster Cluck, yes, that is the actual name, has by far the best story and it's not even a competition and yet is probably the worst in every other aspect compared to the rest. There aren't that many side quests, there's no new enemy type, all of the boss fights really suck except for the last one, and even that one's a bit of a bullet sponge for no real reason. The environments are creative and cool, but don't even compare to the strong aesthetic and scenery of Bounty of Blood or Guns Love and Tentacles. The Fantastic Fuster Cluck also just has the least amount of legendary weapons of any DLC at a whopping 9, and only like 4 of them are worth remembering. At least the class mods and shields are really fun, so there's that. The first 4 DLC unfortunately don't have much endgame content, there's no raids, no trials, no real endgame challenge. Once you finish the story, side quests, and just 100% all the DLC, which doesn't really take that long, there's not much to do. While having no endgame content for four of the biggest DLC in the game is unfortunate, it is made up for by the insane weapons and gear which adds so much build diversity, it's kind of insane. From the DLC weapons in Season Pass 1, a good like 70% of them are able to deal with most of the end game pretty well. And that's 70% of 64 weapons, so there's no shortage of toys to play with. I have a lot of hours put into Borderlands 3 and there's a reason for it. I love just farming for random weapons and gear, experimenting with builds, and seeing how they fare against true Maliwan and true Guardian takedown. Alright, let's talk about Season Pass 2. And this is going to be difficult to talk about since, unfortunately, this was kind of the start of Gearbox's recent downfall. So here we go. I'm about to make myself re- <laughs> Season Pass 2 suffers from an issue which did exist with the previous 4 DLC, but it was never to this comical extent. And that issue, ladies and gentlemen, is called Power Creep. Why'd I say it like a Smash Bros. announcer? Power creep. <laughs> I'll put in like big impact font when I edit this video or something, I don't know. Power creep is something that unfortunately plagues a lot of games, and you most likely have witnessed it, as it's something that can affect both single player and multiplayer games. And it's a pretty simple concept to understand. 
What it basically means is when new things get added to a game that start to heavily outshine older things as they get forgotten and left in the dust. Season Pass 2 has some of the most broken weapons and gear and the damage they provide is so unearned that they feel wrong to use. Half of them feel modded. For starters, the plasma coil. Why does this weapon have this fire rate, shoot in 16 round bursts, and has base damage that competes with most snipers? What? Also, since its rounds count to splash damage, you know damn well what this weapon can do on Moe's. She turns entire maps to nothing but dust and scattered remains. Imagine a laser-focused Norfleet that uses SMG ammo and you have the plasma coil. Frankly, this gun is just broken. It's like Evil Smasher glitched levels of broken. It's like the B in conference call in the early days of Borderlands 2 broken. You get this gun with any parts, any rolls, any anointment, and it's just going to trivialize everything. Here's another power crept item, the Revolter. This shield is so broken it makes the plasma coil look like a well-thought-out creation. With the Revolter equipped, if your shield breaks, you get an additional 200% shock damage and 50% fire rate for 15 seconds. There's this funny little anointment which can summon this effect without actually breaking your shield. Just the 50% fire rate on shield break alone is pretty solid, and if the shock damage was like 40%, this still would have been a top tier shield, no doubt about it. But 200% extra shock damage? <laughs> it's just so goofy! The Plasma Coil and Revolter are the worst offenders when it comes to power crept gear, but there's still so many other weapons like the Kick Charger or the Free Radical which completely outshine a lot of other older weapons. I completely forgot how ridiculous the Kick Charger is. This weapon makes the Ion Cannon, which is a pretty good weapon, look like a nerf gun. On top of that, the Kick Charger only consumes 1 ammo per shot, compared to the Ion Cannons 7 or 8. Busted weapons and gear aren't the only thing that exists in Season Pass 2, so let's talk about something else. I guess it's time we talk about the 4th skill trees. In my opinion, one new playable character would have been so much cooler than a 4th skill tree, but if I'm not mistaken, despite Krieg, Gage, Jack, and Aurelia being fan favorites, they didn't exactly bring in the big bucks, so Gearbox thought that people just don't want new playable Vault Hunters. I found a segment on an article by The Gamer, which I'll show on screen, that delved into why DLC characters won't make a return in Borderlands 3, and I was pretty much right on the dot. Didn't bring in money, so we gotta figure something out. Honestly, I don't completely hate the new skill trees. I think they're incredibly fun, and add lots of much needed build diversity to certain characters. Zane went from being a solid character to downright broken, Moe's can now terrorize maps more effortlessly, Amara has a melee focused tree which I think is pretty fun and necessary, and Flak has a tree which lets you become extremely tanky and have your pet do all the damage for you. Pretty cool stuff. My only real issue with the fourth skill trees is that I just don't like the idea of locking a character's full potential behind a paywall. Zane is the perfect example of a character that becomes completely different with DLC. Base game Zane struggles to do damage on his own and largely relies on his clone to do the killing. Chain Zane is unfortunately a thing of the past due to nerfs and power creep, so base game Zane is just a shell of his former self. With Season Pass 1, he picks up the pace by a lot. He can actually damage things now being on par with his clone rather than relying on it. Zane with his new skill tree on Season Pass 2 becomes a completely different beast. His clone is now just optional as he can run cannon and shield and be practically invincible while evaporating enemies effortlessly. This character went from arguably the hardest one to build for endgame viability to the easiest than my friend Ali is living proof of this since his first character is Zane and he barely had to farm any items to be able to solo True Maliwan and True Guardian Takedown. Designer's Cut is the DLC that includes the new skill trees, arms race, new weapons and gear, and that's basically it. 
this thing should not cost $15. This should be like $10, and even that's kind of pushing it. Designer's Cut is reviewed mostly negative on Steam, and I decided to read some of the reviews, and most of them agree with my points. Having a new skill tree locked behind a paywall is pretty egregious. A lot of reviews are complaining about how this is not worth $15, which is an absolutely fair complaint to have. I don't really blame these people for wanting their money back. Director's Cut, on the other hand, I think is much better than the Designer's Cut, but still has a lot of flaws. I mean, this is the DLC that includes the Revolter and Free Radical, and I am not a fan of those. This DLC, unlike the previous, actually does have a story. Granted, it is by far my least favorite compared to the first four, since the characters used here are the lamest Borderlands 3 characters, which I can understand, but they don't do much with them. After playing this DLC, I was pretty disappointed because I didn't find myself liking Clay, Lorelai, or Ava anymore. I left feeling the same about them. My friend Ali, on the other hand, was actually pretty frustrated half of the time because some of these objectives, especially the last one, are pretty annoying to deal with and are just time wasting. So while my friend despised the story, I felt pretty indifferent about it. Director's Cut also finally adds the first traditional Borderlands raid boss. Maliwan and Guardian Takedown had you pushing towards the boss fights with mobbing sections and objectives, but back in Borderlands 1 and 2, you kinda just pulled up to the boss like an absolute chad, and I think I like both styles equally. The Hemovorus boss fight I honestly thought was really cool, but in my opinion just doesn't compare to how cool the Valkyries, Wotan, Anathema, or Scourge are. The fight just kinda has you in a big empty flat area where it's nothing but you and the boss and some Varkids. I feel like this raid boss was mostly just made for the sake of nostalgia, because a lot of Borderlands 2 raid bosses function this exact same way, big open area, boss in the middle, go and do your thing. And people have been wanting that in Borderlands 3 for a while. When the game launched, people were disappointed to find no traditional raid boss. It's even more disappointing when you think about how this was supposed to be in the base game, but was cut out for some reason. My guess is just time constraints, but feel free to tell me what it was in the comments. Director's Cut does include a lot of behind the scenes stuff, which I think is honestly super cool and a really fun thing to check out on your own time. Maya's funeral animatic was first included in this DLC before they uploaded it to YouTube for everyone to see. There's so much cool stuff to learn about the early development of this game, it's really neat. Director's Cut I think is much more worth the money compared to the Designer's Cut, but overall Season Pass 2 is just a giant mess and was unfortunately the start of Gearbox's questionable decisions on expanding the franchise. Borderlands has a great track record when it comes to DLC, and it was going pretty well for Borderlands 3 until Season Pass 2 came out and proved that something strange was definitely going on behind the scenes. Because these lazy and bad decisions, whether it was regarding balancing or design, would only bleed into Wonderlands and have that game almost suffer the same fate as Borderlands the pre-sequel. But since Wonderlands has such a solid foundation, being a D&D inspired game with Borderlands 3's amazing engine, it managed to still have a decent amount of active players, even if the game has completely fallen out of relevancy. Anyway, let's get to our conclusion, because I have been yapping for way too damn long now, and this video probably shouldn't have been this long. <laughs> Dude, something really f bad's gonna happen to you tomorrow, man. Like, all this luck, it's too much. Uh, yeah, tomorrow a plane's gonna hit my house. <laughs> the title of this video is not much of an exaggeration. With Borderlands 3's last ventures, Wonderland's mistakes, and the failure of New Tales in the Borderlands, people aren't really thinking about Gearbox too highly, so the stakes are definitely up there. Borderlands 4 does not have to be an insanely technically or graphically advanced game. It just has to have a good story and be fun. Borderlands 3 greatly excelled at being a fun game with plenty of replayability, but fell flat on its face trying to deliver even just a competent story. Through trial and error, as well as content creators and fans being very vocal about their frustrations and appreciations, it should not be hard to deliver a good game. But honestly, I have a lot of faith in Gearbox when it comes to that aspect. 
What I fear the most for Borderlands 4 is its story, because you can fix a messy game as much as you'd like, but what you can't fix is a bad story. Once that thing's out there, whatever's done is done. Once all those maps, characters, dialogue, cutscenes, bosses are all out there, you can't redo all of that. So that's why I want this game's story to be crafted with lots of care. If there's anyone who works at Gearbox who somehow watched this entire video and is watching this part of it, I want this message I'm about to deliver to be relayed to as many individuals over there as possible. If there's any Borderlands content creators watching this, I'd love your help too, because I know some of you have connections with the wonderful folks over there at Gearbox Software. I love the Borderlands franchise. I would not write a script this damn long for something I don't care about. As of this video, I am 19 years old, and I have been a fan of this franchise since I was 11. Matter of fact, here's a review I wrote for Borderlands 2 back in 2015. This thing is so damn adorable, I almost cried when I found this because I have absolutely zero memory of writing this and only found it while doing some research for this video. Anyway, I am about to deliver a very short message to the folks over there at Gearbox. You too, Randy. I want you to prick your little magician ears up. So, uh, here goes. Police, for the love of Pandora, make Borderlands 4 story awesome, make Borderlands 4's gameplay awesome, and just take your time with this craft so you can just simply make Borderlands 4 a masterclass of bad assery. If I'm talking to the same folks that made the Maliwan takedown an absolute masterpiece in just a few months, then I don't think this is too much to ask. I hope the word is spread. I hope I got my message across. If you somehow have the attention span of a human being before TikTok, I assume that's the only way you made it to this part of the video. Please do what you can to spread this video around. I worked pretty damn hard on it. Feel free to like, hit that subscribe button so when I upload in another like <laughs> 10 months or something you'll be notified. And comment your thoughts below because I love reading your comments. <laughs> no matter how stupid some of them may be, that's about it for the video. Thank you so much for watching. I'm out this piece. God bless all of you. Come outside! Come outside! Come outside! What's up, guys? What's up, guys? What did I do? Shut up, Mario boss. Shut up. Ooh, we're gonna be brave war. What? <laughs> man, man, he's literally a Metroid boss. He's a Metroid boss. I can't get over it. It's not real. It's not real. <laughs> right? So, uh, what do you guys think of that? <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you guys think of that? What do you... <laughs> yeah, guys. <laughs> well, what, what do you guys? What do you... What? 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 Choke him, choke him, someone, someone please. <laughs> Bro, someone, if someone like talked, it sounded a lot like wouldn't have to kill and eat him, bro. If Ava is a character we have to, that we can play in Borderlands 4, I will kill someone. Why? You make it yourself. I'll play her and I will just jump off a f***ing cliff 50 f***ing times. Randy Pitchford? More like Randy Bitchford. Hitler of the Borderlands lore. <laughs> George Bush doesn't care about black people. Yo, the f cutscene, Yusuf. What cutscene? What cutscene, Yusuf? Skip it. Just skip the f cutscene, Yusuf. Oh, okay. Thank God, I got you. Piece of <laughs> you could not just do that.
<laughs> you said skip the cutscene. You said skip the cutscene, bro. Stop, stop, stop talking. Stop breathing. Stop living. Hey, boo brace. You should probably kill yourself. You should probably shut the f up and join me, man. You f American trash. Please. Join button. I don't care. I don't care anymore. Join.